His eminence, Metropolitan Emmanuel of France, studied in Greece, Paris, and Boston. He became the director of the Office of the Orthodox Church of the European Union when it, it was first established in 1995. In 2003, he was elected Metropolitan of France by the Holy Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. He is co-chair of the Joint Commission of the Theological Dialogue between the Orthodox Church and the Oriental Orthodox Churches and responsible for bilateral academic dialogue with Islam and Judaism. His eminence served as president and vice president of the Conference of European Churches and he is going to reflect on the hundred years of hope on the path to communion. Your eminence, thank you for being here today. Distinguished participants, uh, dear brothers and sisters, um, I would like really to express uh, my congratulations for the, the Conference of European Churches that I have served for years, um, for organizing um, this um, event jointly with uh, the Louvain Center for uh, Eastern and Oriental Christianity. And um, I, I know that uh, my brother, Metropolitan Cleopas, brought uh, the greetings of His Holiness uh, yesterday when at his uh, opening remarks. Um, this event uh, that we commemorate of the 100th anniversary of the Patriarchal Encyclical of 1920 and also of the Lambeth Appeal is um, something that is uh, a historic move that we have to repeat definitely. Um, I believe uh, the conversations of the last two days have shown not only the quality of an excellent uh, theological and historical scholarship, but uh, also the importance of the today's ecumenism. As we are closing um, this uh, second day, I would like to share with you some impressions and reflections taken from the uplifting conference. While uh, reflecting on the many aspects of the 1920 encyclical by the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, I was uh, striking by this quote. It is the duty of the churches which bear the sacred name of Christ not to forget or neglect any longer his new and great commandment of love. Nor should they continue to fall viciously behind the political authorities who truly applying the spirit of the gospel and the teaching of Christ have under happy auspices already set up the so-called League of Nations in order to defend justice and cultivate charity and agreement between the nations." End of quote. As you all know, these words are taken from a 100-year-old document issued in January 1920 by the Ecumenical Patriarchate in all one of its most influential and, and critical encyclicals. And to the churches of Christ everywhere, says the document. And in the aftermath of the First World War, with the terror and massacres had left uh, deep wounds in Europe, in all over Europe, which um, at the turn of the century became bloodless. The victors and uh, vanquished were equally the victims of a warlike force whose scale we can no longer comprehend a global and world war. Christianity was uh, stunned by the barbarism of this time. And uh, I would say that the Orthodox world had been particularly exposed to this explosion of hatred, while Southeastern Europe had not yet completed its transformation into nation states. The Communist Revolution of 1917 um, heralded a period of persecution against Christianity 
and never before seen in human history. Then we had uh, the war between Greece and Turkey, 1919-1922, prepared uh, the ground for the great uh, catastrophe of the exchange of populations between Greece and Turkey. And however, in the midst of these uh, tumults and incredible violence, the publication of this uh, encyclical of the ecumenical patriarchate, okay, there was no patriarch at the time, it was a uh, lock of tenants, 1920, appeared as a sign of hope, resilient, and as an answer to the challenges and opportunities of a different era, a century so close to us, and at the same time so far from our comprehension. In substance and tone, this uh, text uh, differs profoundly from the encyclical of the Eastern Patriarchs of 1848. It was no longer a question, as in the 19th century, of responding to the universal claims of uh, the papacy, but rather of bringing a sustainable response in accordance with the gospel to the division of Christians. And the ecumenical movement was uh, really starting at this moment. The message underlying the encyclical, encyclical may seem obvious to us today, <clears throat> but uh, at that time, the lack of unity among Christian churches nourished the temptations of the states. The search for a theological consensus would become a means to promote unity and communion. And it is essential to remember during the 20th century, the challenge of division became an opportunity for Christian unity as well for establishing peace. Today, one century later, we are called to continue reflecting on the challenges and opportunities Christianity must face in order to keep uh, its prophetic voice in a world influenced by post-modernity, secularization, and the transformation of the very notion of relationship as society and as reality of communion. But before uh, tackling this issue, allow me to reflect uh, on the principle of dialogue, uh, which is also a sign of today's global civilization. Taken in most, uh, its most fundamental uh, definition, the word dialogue, in the sense of dialogos, is a simple exchange of words. Immediately, the term takes on a theological dimension. Well, how can there be an exchange of words without participation in the very mystery of the word, the word of God, echoing the first verses of the gospel according to St. John, the theologian, in the beginning was the word, and the word was turned to God, and the word was God. In the beginning, it was turned to God, and all things were through him, and nothing that was was without him. In him was life, and the life was the light of man, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness understood it not. Therefore, dialogue is a divine mission from which humanity cannot be separated, for dialogue, first of all, unites. It must thus be understood as a something different from negotiation, debate, confrontation, invective, teaching, etc. To paraphrase a famous quote from Claude Lévi-Strauss, when speaking of civilization, dialogue implies the coexistence of cultures offering the maximum diversity among them, and even consists of this coexistence. The dialogue appears as a paradoxical tension between coexistence and expo exposure to the maximum of diversity. And this lesson applies to us in the ecumenical as well as the interfaith field, 
where dialogue is not only theoretical, but also a praxis, an application of what we teach and say, and uh, of coexistence. By this, I mean that dialogue cannot be conceived as a means only, but is also an end in itself, a transformative experience. And dialogue, understood as a means of, conver of, con of conversion, loses its effectiveness. But when it uh, becomes transformative, it takes on its full intensity. Dialogue makes it possible to combat prejudice, and even Plato wrote his text in uh, dialogue forms because the transmission of wisdom needs uh, otherness. In, um, it connects, and the dialogue builds bridges between our churches and strengthens the desire and quest for unity in communion. Dialogue becomes an inclusive uh, principle in which our churches are called to contribute to the global scene. There is a document blessed by the Ecumenical Patriarchate entitled, entitled For the Life of the World Towards the Social Ethos of the Orthodox Church, published this year, reads, Dialogue in the Orthodox Understanding is essentially and primarily primordially a reflection of the dialogue between God and humanity. It is initiated by God and conducted through the divine logos, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Revealing all human life, dialogue takes place in all our encounters, personal, social, or political, and must always be extended to those who adhere to religions different than our, our own. And in all our connections and relationships, the Word of God is mystically present and uh, ever guiding our exchange of words and ideas towards a spiritual union of hearts in Him. Dear friends, the so-called return of religion was anticipated by the rise of this, of the diplomatic humanism which developed in the context of the Cold War and which aimed to open communication with Christians caught on the other side of the Iron Curtain. The World Council of Churches, for example, had enabled real progress to be made by building bridges in both sides of Europe. And Pope John Paul II's commitment to peace, especially during the first meeting in Assisi in 1986, is also to be remembered. It was the first interreligious meeting of this scale. And that uh, same year, the United Nations had proclaimed 1986 as the International Year of Peace at uh, a time when East and West opposition was still polarizing the planet and the war in Lebanon was uh, raging. What about the return of hope, which um, while talking about communion, and we need uh, to stress this hope even today at these difficult times of the pandemic that we are all going through. As you well know, the Greek word uh, for communion, work uh, for koinonia, um, more than just fellowship of connection or even unity, it signifies discerning what uh, we have in common with the other. And uh, this can only happen through dialogue. This is precisely why communion is a matter of dialogue and not just a problem of negotiation. It is something learned over time and through practice. And unfortunately, the truth is that we have lost the sense and sensitivity of being in communion as much as in dialogue sometimes. 
This is why 100 years later, as we continue to gather in an ecumenical form, and as uh, the Conference of European Churches has uh, done for all these decades of its mission, let us give uh, this final word to prayer, this, uh, this ultimate form of dialogue to shape ourselves by the grace of the loving God and make the mystery of communion the horizon of our unity. Thank you very much.